The ATBI, or uh, Adirondack All Taxa Biodiversity Inventory, is, a, is a, an endeavor started in 2006 um, with a goal of, of um, surveying the, the biodiversity in the Adirondack Park and also connecting people to the natural world through participation in this, in this survey. Well, I think it's remarkable at Fallensby, it's, it's a large, undisturbed tract of land, uh, relatively undisturbed, and it's got a fairly good complement of flora and fauna uh, compared to historical times. It's also got, of course, historical tradition. Um, it's where they reintroduced bald eagles to the state. Fallensby Pond is kind of a very unique situation. It's 14,000 acres, um, and it's ecologically intact. Uh, you know, all the way through from the forest, through the aquatic system, down to the lake, through the outlet. Um, this is a big contiguous piece of property that has had very little influence of human disturbance. Uh, so it's a great little microcosm of ecologically what we're really striving for in the Adirondack Park. This was kind of the shakedown uh, of a series of three days over the course of the field season that Michelle Brown, our lead scientist, is running. Teams of, of experts all across the ownership, which is 14,600 acres, and uh, really helping us better understand what's here. In, in many ways, what the McCormick family preserved for so many years. And uh, uh, very exciting day. I think Mrs. McCormick would have liked this a lot. She was a great naturalist. The core of the ATBI is our, is our taxonomic working groups, or TWIGs. So each of these TWIGs is headed up by, by an expert in, in, in a certain group of organisms. So for example, we have a mammal TWIG, we have a an, uh, dragonfly and damselfly TWIG, a fish TWIG. So all of these different, different um, groups of organisms. And so each of these TWIGs has a, a team leader who is, is an expert in that field. And under them, they, they've then recruited people who have either a, sort of an existing knowledge or a real interest in, in that group of organisms. By having these, these twigs, we're able to sort of pool the expertise in a specific area, and then by bringing all of those twigs together, they give us kind of this composite expertise across a broad array of taxa. But driving out here today, you know, you I have in the back of the van, I have all of these people. At the first van, I had the, the dragonfly and damselfly folks and the fungi folks, and it was an incredible experience. I've got all of these Latin names and common names of species being shouted out because they're watching things out the window. So my job was to not stop the van because if I'd stopped the van, I would have lost them and I would never have got them back in the van. But as we're going along, this just incredible sense of excitement and sense of collaboration that was there um, was something I guess I hadn't really thought about and I hadn't realized how energizing that would be. We have a number of students here and a number of the general public here as well to, to help teach them. Um, we have students here from SUNY ESF that are helping with the small mammal trapping. They're learning how to small mammal trap. They're learning the diversity of species that are out there. They're learning how to care for these species when they do catch them. And it's really exciting to be with all these different people who are, you know, really just here to, to study wildlife and know a lot about wildlife, so we're camping next to a mammal group, but it's neat to see all, all this different science going on. So... So I'm a bryologist, which means I study bryophytes, and bryophytes are mosses, liverworts, and hornworts. Um, so there are differences between those three types of organisms, but all together they're considered bryophytes. And for most people, we're talking about moss. And I used to be a field biologist, so I, I relished the chances to get out in the field with uh, compatriots uh, and do survey work for birds, mammals, herps, dragonflies, everything. I'm part of the avian group, uh, so the bird group. We're, we're, we're out here for the next 24 hours trying to oh, identify as many of the birds as we can you know, on the property here. Uh, so we're going to walk the trails, uh, paddle the lake itself. As, as we go through the woods, we're going to be uh, listening for songs. Uh, most of my crew knows the songs, so they're going to be listening uh, and 
writing down uh, obviously what they what they hear, uh, but we're certainly going to try to see the bird. Well, what we hope to do is um, add to the body of knowledge, uh, add to science's understanding of, of 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 everything that could possibly be here as far as you know, our our area is, is is the avian community, but. Um, we're trying to, to, to really show why it's, to document why it might be special in terms of life. some small mammals here. We wanted five unique areas that had unique characteristics, hoping to get different assemblages of small mammals. The traps have a little wad of fiber fill in them because it was a little cool last night, so we want the animals to be comfortable. If they're in there all night, they can kind of get off of the cold floor and make a little nest, and they're baited with a peanut butter mixture. Each area had 25 traps. Uh, we set most of them up in a little grid format, so we were trying to space them about 10 to 20 meters apart, uh, five by five grid, just to kind of cover that area. And we want to be out there within 12 hours after setting the trap so that we can be out there very soon to catch those animals and, and just see what we have for species and if they're adults or juveniles and what sex they are and then just let them go. seen anything that I haven't seen before. We've seen like, I've definitely seen some chickadees, that's kind of basic. Um, blue jays, um, some red winged blackbirds. How's that? But anyways, we'll go back 100 yards or so and I'll do a couple of uh, barred owl hoots, which is who cooks for you, who cooks for you. <laughs> Okay. Slower, <laughs> louder. Uh, tonight we're going to be surveying for bats. What we have here is actually we have a, a equipment that records echolocation. And as the bats are coming out and they're foraging and they're looking for their insect prey items, they emit a call. Each species has their own unique call, so it downloads into a software program in our computer in the car here. And what we're looking at is the slope and frequency of those calls. And we have sort of a little um, chart that tells us, based on the slope and frequency, which bat we're listening to. It's not an exact science, but it has been field tested and they, they're pretty accurate with these methods. This is it. This is a dead raven that we found, and it's well over a week old. So there's a lot of different um, carrion beetles and domestic beetles on it. And we're just trying to collect some of them.
you all, little guy. Measure off the distance from the culvert upstream if something that's easy to record and repeatable. Oh yeah, it's a red F, you're right. He's just not so bright because he's, he's the cool. F, yeah. And he has the moose tracks. I don't know if you've ever seen him before. No, no never. That's over six inches. But a lot of the species that we're finding are actually um, what we might call ind indicator species. And they tell us about particular kinds of habitats that are out here. So if we find certain species of bird, say pileated woodpeckers, they'll tell us that we have mature forests with the right kinds of foods that they require. And there are particular species of concern that we're focusing on today as well, things like rusty blackbirds. We have that, that snapshot in time that we're discovering today in our bio blitz, then we'll be able to come back to this spot and we'll be able to look and say, well, what, what changes are we seeing? Are we seeing those changes perhaps because, because of conservation efforts and, and, and as the forest becomes older and, and some of these sort of structural legacies develop, do we see species coming in? But there are other things going on here in the Adirondacks and in many places that are of concern. We have climate change, we have invasive species, that's a white admiral butterfly. One or two species of sphinx moth, which are closely related to silk moths, and several species of moths that are called prominence. Wow. There's a turtle each. Oh, it's a leech, yeah. Yeah, wow. It is really, that's really odd how fat that is. That must mean... Eating it well. Yeah. Just walking out here onto this beach, seeing the entire lake right here uh, at sunset is it's it's moving. It's uh, it's just a special historic spot. Uh, I mean, culturally, it's uh, fascinating what went on here years ago. Um, and, uh, and and what's great is uh, to see the wildlife that was probably still active back in 1858 or whenever they were uh, they were back here. The philosophers camp. The the opportunity for us to preserve a place that's so unchanged, so pristine, is very special. I think we have an obligation to the family, the McCormick family, and to the people of New York State to hand this uh, to them in, in the wonderful condition and, and with, with a greater depth of understanding about what's really here. To have the ability to come in here to Fallensby Pond uh, is just an amazing experience. It's, it's kind of been a um, you know, the, the holy ground. Uh, those of us that read Walden Pond and know Thoreau and Emerson and uh, have kind of followed a little bit, know a little bit about the history of the Philosopher's Camp, um, to be here and to experience this place has just been very special. Being out here with my family is, is a, a real gift. I'm, I feel incredibly thankful to have this opportunity to have my children experience this. I mean, it's thrilling for me, and they probably don't really understand, you know, it to the, it, in the depth that I do, but um, someday they'll, they will. Oh, I, I think uh, just being out with uh, scientists who know a lot, it's, it's just an enriching, informative experience uh, for people, I think, uh, and people, like people appreciate, I think, the scenic quality of this place, the, the grandeur, uh, the relatively undisturbed nature of it. If someone's going to appreciate nature, they've got to see it first, they've got to learn about it, and that kind of fosters an appreciation for it, and this goes a long way just toward that. I think the BioBlitz will help all of us understand what's here, and it will excite a wider circle of people, and may help inspire research through the eyes of scientists and experts that 
It will make a wider circle of people curious about the natural world, both inside the gate here at Follinsby and out in the world. But for me, that energy and all of those people working together in that short space of time was something that was, was incredible. And I know that everybody that sort of participated in the event came away with that sense of energy. And one of the things that really excites me for our next Bio, Bio Blitz is, is getting more of the general public involved and sharing that sense of energy with them because I think that, that really is the core of the ATBI. And I, I think it really is an incredible venue, not only for the science, but also for that idea of making those connections to the natural world. So yeah, that's something that I think that you, you, you had to be here to experience, but it was really valuable.